Dear all, we'll start our uh, panel two of the second day of okay. uh, IDM. Please have a seat that we can start. Our panel uh, two of today's work is called Migrants' Voices, Testimony of the Migrants Impacted by the Climate Change. It will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Manuel Marquez Priera, Head of the Migration, Environment, Climate Change and Risk Reduction Division in IOM. Manuel, floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to moderate today this incredible and significant and relevant panel as we approach to COP bringing migrant voices. A testimony of migrants impacted by climate change is an excellent opportunity to bring the voices of affected communities and individuals. I would like to highlight that climate action cannot be effective if it's not inclusive. Climate action should consider and integrate the voices and leave the experiences of the people it meant to serve. Just like a global crisis, climate change too exposes vulnerabilities in our societies. However, different groups of people have different levels of exposure and different levels of vulnerability to extreme climate events at the worst of its impacts. Therefore, the diversity of their testimonies further contributes to the well-rounded uh, adaptation plans and risk reduction strategies needed to address these challenges. Migrants' testimonies can serve as a great tool for policymakers as they provide unique insights and diverse viewpoints that can sometimes be overlooked on policy and implementation. Highlight today the significant involvement of youth perspectives as a climate actors must not only be to ensure their inclusiveness, but also to be fair and just. Involving youth in climate-oriented policy is also one way to ensure that the ability of future generations to sustain their needs is not taken away. But also engaging diasporas. Diasporas are essential actors who can share their expertise, transfer knowledge and technology to address the climate crisis. But whilst the value of diaspora contributions for in cases of remittances or direct investments in skills transfers. It's also important that they work in their origin countries and in the countries of destination. They are widely recognized as a contributing to addressing climate change to support economical development and many countries face the challenge and the lack of capacity to design effective policies and implement them with a meaningful and inclusive scale. This panel will also explore the potential channels which can allow migrants to have a seat at the decision-making table to ensure that migrant voices are heard, but they are also part of the decision-making process when it comes to national adaptation plans, national determined contributions, and disaster risk reduction strategies. Allow me now to briefly introduce our panel and recall that this session will be guided by some fundamental questions to uh, our panelists. Um, we will have the majority or the panelists will all be online, so it will be an interactive uh, session. And I would welcome all of you uh, interventions and enabling a dialogue with our esteemed panelists. It's my pleasure to introduce you to this outstanding set of panelists for the event today. First, Ms. Rose Kobusinge, an Ugandan climate justice advocate that focuses her work on driving ambition for the inclusion of marginalized African voices in climate action and building resilience of marginalized rural, urban, and refugee communities. Rose is also a leader in several youth movements, including Youth Go Green Uganda and African Youth for Climate, and she's also the founder of People in Nature Initiative. We also have with us today Mr. Sheban Chowdhury that has been leading and delivering public sector policies and projects in Bangladesh. He is also the co-founder of the Bangladeshi Diaspora Climate Action Group and an intervener on the implementation of climate change uh, policies and approaches in Bangladesh. We will also count today with Ms. Rashid Begum that hails from Barishal district 
one of the most climate vulnerable coastal districts in Bangladesh. Barishal is prone to many disasters, including catastrophic cyclones. The village where Miss Hashida used to live was washed away by Cyclone Sidr, leaving her family homeless. Her entire family took the decision to move to an informal settlement to get a job and improve her life. We will have her live, live testimony today. And finally, Mr. Jerome Obreit, that he is the executive director of the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, BRAC, and he plays a critical role in advancing BRAC's global strategy, resource mobilization, and organizational development. Mr. Jerome was also the secretary general of Médecins Sans Frontières International, having been also the director of programs previously. It is my pleasure to have this panel with us. Allow me now, before we start, to guide and share with you the questions that will shape this dialogue for all of you to have that in advance. What are the needs of the communities to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change and avert and minimize displacement, being perspectives of integrated policy? What measures are needed to address the links between climate change, human mobility, and food security, the interlinking of crises? What are the messages of migrants, youth, diaspora, displaced persons to policymakers addressing the links between climate change, human mobility, and food security? And finally, how can diasporas be more effectively engaged in mitigating the effects of food insecurity, and how can barriers to remittances and other forms of support from migrants and diasporas to home communities can be removed? We would now welcome our participants to present their views. We will have around 10 minutes to each of the panelists. Allow me to start with Rose. Dear Rose, I think you are online. Can you please provide us your statement? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, moderator, and thanks to the panelists that are joining us today and the audience that is joining us today. Uh, as for the introduction, my name is Rose Kovsing and I'm a climate activist from Uganda. And uh, I'm also a contact point for the Yango Migration Working Group. Yango is the official youth and children constituency of the UNFCCC. And I lead uh, the, uh, last year, at the end of last year, I established a working group on climate migration. And uh, this year we've, have, we've, we've had immense support from IOM and UNICEF and the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative. Uh, so today's topic is very personal and to me, but also of passion to me, uh, talking about food security, talking about you know climate mobility. I mean, right now I'm studying in the UK and uh, the reason why I left my country, Uganda, to study here was because I grew up in an, an agriculture uh, background, about agriculture family where my parents work in tea factory in, in the Western part of Uganda. But then I kept seeing them being laid off from work, especially when droughts hit. And whenever I asked my mom, she would tell me uh, she doesn't know why the droughts are increasing because she'd be laid off work at least twice a year. And that really impacted the kind of schools I went to, the kind of food we ate, impacted my siblings, impacted like everything, our health and everything. So um, when I reached, when I finished my A-levels, I went to university. I really didn't know which course to do. And I was like, because I loved wildlife when I was growing up. So I wanted to do something in, in relation to wildlife conservation, but I did not know which course to do. And so when I went to university, I was like, maybe I could do wildlife conservation, but I ended up doing environmental science to be closer to nature. By then I had never heard about, and this is 2015, I'd never heard anything about climate change. So when I did my undergraduate, then there was an elective uh, on climate change and, and most people refused to do it because uh, we thought like it's climate, it's all about climate science and atmospheric science and it's very hard but it was only like four weeks of studying about climate change, everything about climate change. So I went in for that course. And when I recognized that the wealthy nations are the ones that have contributed to the climate crisis and people like my family and my community and people in Uganda, women and children are the most vulnerable. And that is the one that motivated me to want to understand more about climate change. 
and made me made me to apply for courses uh, in places where they teach more about climate change because I really wanted to understand more about this topic. And that is how I found myself leaving my country and uh, now studying in the UK, understanding climate change. I did a master's in environmental change and management at the University of Oxford. And now I'm following up on the research on uh, energy transition, uh, clean energy transition in refugee camps. So this topic is passionate from my experience but also being, uh, I could be called a migrant who I am right now in the UK and uh, I could be part of the diaspora. So it's everything uh, for me. So, and then I also did in my undergraduate, after I started understanding about climate change, I did a study on food security and climate change in, a, in some Western district, Kamwenge in Uganda. And I found that I interviewed about 120 people and 90, 5% of the people didn't know about climate change, but but they approved of the of the issues with you know reducing productive agriculture productivity, uh, the extreme droughts happening every almost every year and the frequency of increasing, the unpredictability of rainfall uh, and planting seasons. And for the few that uh, said that they knew about climate change, the five percent. Most of them related it to, you know, the will of God. Some few of them had had uh, about climate change from uh, from development partners and NGOs, and some have had have overheard had overheard it on the radio. And then uh, I found some interesting, uh, you know, reasons uh, and thoughts about climate change where people were thinking because uh, the the community where I was there was no grid, there was no grid electricity, so some people had solar panels. Uh, solar home systems and people thought it's because of those solar home systems, the solar panels that are attracting the droughts and uh, causing suffering and famine in, in, in their in their country, I mean in their community. Some thought she's the will of God, God is punishing people uh, for, for the sins and that is why he's sending the droughts and then the floods when it's rainy season. So, so all these experiences have shaped what I do and what I am and uh, when I think about the question on, uh, you know, the, the, when I think about the, the first question, what will, uh, what are the needs of communities to adapt the advanced effects of climate change and avert and minimize displacements? Again, going back to the study I was talking about on food security and climate change, I found that most of the men had gone to the cities, and uh, I, mean, I mean to the small towns to, to work because it wasn't making more sense for uh, both the women and men to stay in the village when productivity, agricultural productivity is extremely, uh, you know, not not valid, extremely invalid. So the women were staying home uh, to to grow food for 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 consumption, but also take care of the children. And uh, so, and then when I asked also about how there was uh, the women were adapting, because I I try to find more women to talk to, uh, even though most of them didn't want to talk to me, they, they would wait for the man to come and I talk to them. But for those ones who I was able to talk to, they told me they have their adaptation. You don't eat, you only eat one meal in a day, which is dinner. So during lunch, lunch you just drink porridge and you serve the children porridge. And, and then I thought, when I saw this question, I was like, what is it that actually, uh, what, what is it that, that the community need? It goes back to information and knowledge. So there's a very big gap on climate education. And uh, in talking about climate education, it's very important for, uh, for the developing world, for the global South countries, to a country like Uganda and many African countries to integrate climate education, awareness and knowledge in, in every sector, whether it's health sector, whether it's, uh, it's you know, religious religious uh, communities and whether it is you know food so we need to integrate education and of course in the curricula in the school i know that one is a bit political we are still pushing to ensure that climate education is included in in, in curricula starting from elementary school but i know that one is also taking some time and that is why for many young people for, for a few of us young people who have the, who have 
the privilege to understand climate change, we are coming out with different, uh, with different programs that take climate education and awareness rising at the grassroots level, but also on online, uh, including one of the organizations that I started, recently started, which is People and Nature Initiative, but rebranded to Climate and Biodiversity Initiative recently. So that the climate and information gap, and of course the digital gap are a big challenge. And if that is not addressed, then it is very hard to actually support communities that are on the move or at the risk of displacement. So we need more investments from uh, the governments, from philanthropists, from, from banks and from you know, the global north in uh, addressing the issues on information, uh, knowledge, uh, technology and, and digital. And uh, I was also thinking on uh, you know, the need for data and uh, research but also not forgetting the indigenous knowledge. So uh, even though I thought that people gave response regarding, you know, the solar panels attracting the droughts, I felt like, you know, you we can we can we can bridge that knowledge gap with you know with research, but also not dismissing what they think, but trying to use what these people think to actually make them uh, feel part of the solution but also uh, bridge that knowledge gap. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I also, when it, again, coming back to indigenous knowledge, I think we've forgotten about indigenous knowledge. There's no science without indigenous knowledge. And the combination of science and indigenous knowledge will provide the best solutions that are, 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 are relevant to the context that, uh, that people are, uh, are in. So, and it's not possible to just, you know, impart or just, you know, force solutions on people without them recognizing the challenges and the problems and, and, and coming up as co-designers and partners with their own solutions. And then thinking about the question of what measures are needed to address the links between climate change, human mobility and food security. I think I may have already touched on that. So I think there's need for safety nets because right now I've been working on a project on addressing loss and damage uh, it's a proposal, it's not a project, uh, on, on addressing loss and damage in the flood prone areas of Kasese in Uganda. And the project brings together, like, it's a combination of rising awareness about climate change, building hope, because many young people and, uh, and many, you know, rural, rural citizens have lost hope because of the unproductivity of, 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 of agriculture, because of the frequent floods, they have lost their loved ones, they've lost their property, they are homeless, some of them are in, are in camps, in, uh, are internally displaced, so they've lost hope. We're trying to come up with a project that kind of combines all these uh, hope building and building community cohesion, and uh, in a way that uh, represents the values, but also the, the visions of those people. So, and uh, I was also thinking about those food safety nets, especially for the people that are in, you know, hazard prone areas. Even though I don't like always saying the governments, but yes, the governments have the role, have a very big role and the, our politicians and leaders and uh, decision makers and development partners have that role to actually, uh, you know, provide safety nets for the people that are in risky places but also you know planned relocations is a very big is a very big uh, option that that needs to be undertaken there are people especially poor ones and marginalized and uh, those ones who don't have access to their underserved who live who live in areas that are known to be flood prone or hazard prone or landslide prone and you'll never find the rich people there. So that is why the climate issue is very, first of all, it's a humanitarian crisis, but it's very, uh, you know, disproportionate in terms of who it affects. So if if there these safety nets in terms of food safety nets for the people at risk and people in the move, uh, but also of those planned relocations away from people, I mean, away from hazard prone areas, but again, also, the insurance, you know, insurance is one way, especially on food. Uh, people are growing food and they're growing crops and animals, they're rearing animals, but then when a rapid onset happens or whether it's a low onset, they lose their livelihoods, they lose their life, they lose who they are. So insurance 
can be one way that can be uh, that could help in terms of providing resilience and uh, and alternatives. And uh, I guess I'll conclude on speaking about I cannot I cannot leave without talking about the messages from the migrants and youth and diaspora. I really need to tell you that, especially in the youth perspective, the youth are worried. The youth are anxious. The youth are not sure about their future. But at the same time, the youth are hopeful. They are hopeful that we have the power to actually change everything. We just need to get together. We just need to stand together in solidarity. We just need to stop representing our political views to representing humanity. Humanity is at risk, nature is at risk. And this is, a I, climate, the climate crisis is a test, is a test of humanity, is a test of our role as human beings and uh, on this planet. So uh, the young people believe that we can, we, can, we can stand by the limit of 1.5. It's not the goal, but it's the limit. We're not supposed to hit it. We're supposed to live below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So, uh, and the young migrants, many young migrants, especially young Africans, are perishing in the Mediterranean Sea. They are perishing as they walk through the, the Sahara Desert, trying to escape to, to Europe. Not because they want to move or they want to die. It's because they are being forced. They are pushing factors. And migration or human mobility has been for a long time has been an adaptation option to or a, a way to escape crisis, a way to escape conflict, a way to escape suffering. So even with the climate crisis, worsening conflict, worsening uh, loss of livelihoods, worsening, uh, you know, peace issues. So it is still, migration is still an, a, an option, is that still an, an adaptation option that should be recognized. Because if it's not recognized, we'll continue losing many young people, especially young Africans across the, the Sahara Desert, the Sahel, across the Mediterranean Sea. And that means we need to come together as the world, as, as human beings. Because, you know, if someone is running from danger and, and you're pushing them to stay in danger, then it doesn't make sense as a human being. But what we need to do is address the root causes that affect these young people, especially with poverty, with uh, lack of education. Uh, if we can address those issues, but also try to be as, uh, as stand in, sol in solidarity, but also be guided by empathy and historical responsibility as human beings, but also uh, you know, collaboration between the global south and the global north, but also collaboration between uh, you know, communities uh, cross country and in country collaborations, then we'll protect uh, most of the young people from uh, the issues and protection issues and the death that they face as they try to move. From, uh, from the crisis of climate change. And uh, again, I cannot also forget that many young people are dying in, in, in Saudi Arabia at the moment, especially from African countries. I don't know if you are aware about that, but there is labor migration that is happening, massive labor migration. And many young, it's mostly young girls, young women that are dying out there because of, uh, most of them die because of torture from, from their bosses because they work as housemaids. Most of them are raped. And that is something that the, the world needs to come and address. It's, it's now beyond the countries, the sending countries and receiving countries. I think we need to come together to address that challenge. Uh, lastly, I also need to say that the diaspora uh, and the migrants are not just victims. They have solutions. We have solutions. It's just that we just need a bit of, you know, facilitation, facilitation in terms of capacity building, facilitation in terms of meaningful inclusion of young people, communities at risk, migrants, diaspora, in decision making, not just as listeners, but as it, people who have solutions and can influence policy and can influence decisions. And uh, we have solutions on the ground. Funding is a big problem. I'm sure everyone has been talking about funding, but it's time that we're, we're that the leaders and the people involved, you know, come up with funding mechanisms that actually respond to the acts, uh, to the needs of young people, the migrants, at the same time address the issues with access uh, to funding uh, that is available. Uh, 
I think I'll, I'll first stop here and uh, thanks for, for listening to me. I could speak about this topic like forever. Thank you, Rose, and it's always a pleasure listening to you. I think we will have further cooperations, not only today, but in the, the weeks ahead as we get closer to COP. I would like now to invite Mr. Shehab Chowdhury to provide us his remarks. Hi, thank you, moderator. Um, uh, good morning and, and good afternoon, uh, all distinguished members and, and colleagues. Um, firstly, thank you so much for having me. Um, and, and in particular, I'd, I'd like to put my thanks on um, on record for the IOM London team uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, so my name is Shehab Chowdhury. Uh, I've spent my uh, entire career working in the UK public sector, uh, including local government, including the, the National Health Service, and now currently uh, in central government, where I specialise uh, on policies that address climate change and support net zero, uh, which is the UK government's ambitions to become carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, but I'm not here representing the UK government. I'm here representing the Bangladeshi Diaspora Climate Action Group based in the UK, uh, which I helped set up earlier this year. And I think this follows on really nicely from the points Rose has just made. Um, and, you know, you know, People like Rose, people like Rashida, who we're going to hear later on, they're they're at the forefront of a changing world, a changing climate, uh, and you know climate change is a stark reality for them, and as it is for for many, you know, you know millions and billions around the world. Uh, what I'll be doing is shifting the discussion slightly to unpick what more can diaspora communities do to be part of this solution. And I think Rose just sort of hit the nail on the head there a little bit by saying that, you know, we've got so much more to offer. Um, and, and, and not only with regards to food security and, and the issue of um, things like livelihoods, but also wider challenges that are induced by climate change, be it displacement, be it things like loss and damage. Um, I think I'm going to ask uh, the group, how can we support and learn from countries of origin as a diaspora group, but how can we also better channel these passions and these contributions from diaspora communities to their countries of origin? And how can we do this in a much more sustainable and meaningful way? And of course, I'll be using the lens of the UK based Bangladeshi diaspora, but I'm also very, very keen to, to learn from others, you know, what is best practice across the globe. Uh, so what I'll do, uh, you know, very quickly within the 10 minutes I have is give a bit of an introduction to myself, uh, discuss some of my personal connections with Bangladesh, then discuss how the BDCA uh, came about, what our aims are. And finally, uh, give a couple of recommendations to, to the team to, to discuss. Um, so just a bit about me. So, so, so there's roughly 600,000 British Bangladeshis living in the UK, uh, and, and that makes us one of the largest Bengali diasporas in the world. Uh, and we can uh, contribute significantly through skills and financial resources to both Bangladesh and the UK. Uh, we have four members uh, in Parliament, in the UK Parliament, all of whom are women. Uh, we have leaders in British industry, in academia, in the civil service, uh, in the charity sector, in arts and culture, etc. And I myself, I am a second generation British Bangladeshi, uh, born and raised in Southeast England. And like many others uh, of the Bangladeshi diaspora in the UK, my family uh, is from Silet and specifically the Shunamgonj district. Um, and we've always had very strong um, you know, very strong personal ties with Bangladesh. Uh, as a family, we would go over uh, every every couple of years to visit. Uh, and the floods earlier this summer, which devastated parts of Shunamgonj and uh, like surrounded districts within Silet, that was very def that was very difficult and very personal for us. And and like like many others across the world, we um, you know raised funds to support relief efforts. Uh, and, and this touches upon one of the first sort of key things that I wanted to raise, which was uh, something that the moderator already flagged, which is the issues around remittances and the benefits of diaspora communities um, you know, financially contributing to the country of origin is widely recognised. Um, you know, diasporas have a long history of giving back through things like remittances, through investments, through charitable giving. Um, in terms of the UK-based Bangladeshi diaspora, we contribute in excess of £1.3 billion in remittances to Bangladesh every year. And this is where I and the Bangladeshi Diaspora Action Group strongly believe that we can do more. Uh, in fact, we need to do more. 
um, and we need to go beyond just using this financial lens. And you know, the speakers on this panel have been asked what are the key messages that we would like to deliver to policymakers. And if there's only one one message that I would like to give to policymakers and to everyone listening here to take away, that is, diaspora communities need to be more than just reactive to climate disasters. We shouldn't just be cash cows that pump money in after disaster strikes, we need to sit on that table, as, as Rose just mentioned, and be proactive and work with local agencies in the countries of origins and with the national governments, and they need to work with us. I think it would be wrong of me to, to say that this isn't happening. I, th I think there are examples where diaspora communities absolutely are working with their countries of origin, but there's opportunities to do much, much more, particularly when I think about the Bangladeshi diaspora in the UK. Um, and at a minimum, I think we, we require two things. Number one, that is diaspora communities to, um, in their countries of residence to get organized, bring like-minded people together, have a collective vision and do your best to be seen. You know, stakeholders need to know you exist. And this is one of the reasons why I jumped at this opportunity when, you know, when I was invited by the IOM, you know, to show that the BDCA exists. And number two, it's for the country of origin, their governments and their local agencies please work with us, you know, please, please know that we exist. If these two things happen, we can leverage resources, we can share expertise and learn from one another, but we can also develop sustainable initiatives and projects that will help support mitigation, adaptation um, efforts, particularly when we think about things like food security. Um, now, I'm gonna quickly discuss some of the context behind the Bangladeshi Diaspora Climate Action Group. And I want to take us back one year. So last October, I was lucky enough to be part of the Bangladeshi Diaspora Leaders Program, which was organised by Common Purpose, uh, British Council and Lead Bangladesh. And this brought together British Bangladeshis um, from across the UK, uh, focused on one central challenge. And that was how can we as Bangladeshi diaspora leaders support young leaders of Bangladesh with information and knowledge to address the country's development challenges using the lens of sustainable development goals. So there was a really, really key uh, climate focus here, uh, but the program also gave us an opportunity to mentor young people from Bangladesh. And this was at a time of COP26, which I'm sure everyone here can remember that the UK hosted. And for many of us British Bangladeshis, we were also celebrating 50 years of Bangladeshi independence. But many of us were asking that question, given that Bangladesh is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, I think it's ranked seventh uh, by the global risk, uh, global climate risk index. Will Bangladesh exist in another 50 years? Would we see 100 years of Bangladeshi independence? Uh, in fact, one British Bangladeshi diaspora group called Freedom 50 uh, wrote and hand delivered a letter uh, to the British Prime uh, to, to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, sorry, at COP26, uh, outlining the need for climate justice. And I think this demonstrates the political capital of diasporas, which uh, you know, you know, myself and the BDCA argue is largely untapped. Uh, so earlier this year. Uh, three of us diaspora leaders came together and discussed this need to establish a network of British Bangladeshis interested in climate change to come together and deliver sort of tangible actions to support Bangladesh. So, so we set one up, we set up the Bangladeshi Diaspora Climate Action Group. And in terms of some of our aims and some of our purposes, um, this, this brings together um, professionals within the sustainability and climate change fields from British Bangladeshi diasporas uh, to work um, alongside individuals and agencies within Bangladesh and the UK to deliver action-based solutions towards mitigating the impacts of climate change in Bangladesh. And the idea is to leverage the collective sort of group's resources, uh, which means uh, expertise, skills and networks to then progress solutions which utilise key stakeholders and local pathways to deliver long-term change. So we've been working with the IOM uh, through the Diaspora for Climate Action project. And through this, uh, we held our first BDCA meeting in August, a couple of months ago, uh, at the IOM London office, which we're very grateful for. There are about 20 to 25 British Bangladeshi leaders from across a number of different sectors, including humanitarian aid, climate finance, sustainable land use, waste management, law, renewable energy, decarbonisation, academia, the list goes on. And although we're at a very early stage of our journey, we believe that we can add most value by acting as a strategic 
uh, network to help join those dots. We can signpost relevant individuals and groups to one another. And we could also support idea generation and potentially project delivery. The second sort of key area where we think we can add value as a diaspora group is to create an evidence-led cross-sector lobbying group uh, with, a, with a range and wealth of expertise to work with the Bangladeshi government, to work with the UK government on climate change and wider environmental issues affecting Bangladesh. Um, and we've had several pieces of work currently in the pipeline. As I mentioned, uh, we're already uh, engaging with the IOM and will continue to feed in and shape the Diaspora for Climate Action program, which is due to go live in January 2023. Uh, we're really keen to learn from other diaspora groups, the Albanian, Jamaican and Ghanaian groups. Uh, we've also uh, attending a COP27 side event, which highlights the important roles of diasporas as global climate actors. Uh, you know, again, we want to learn from best practice uh, around di diaspora involvement in their countries of origin. Um, I see, I see, we've got um, uh, you know members from BRAC. We're also engaging with BRAC uh, as it develops its its global strategy on climate change. Uh, we're speaking to the UK government's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, who again are very keen to engage with the diaspora, Bangladeshi diaspora, on climate issues. And finally, we're also working with the British Asian Trust, who are a British Asian diaspora organisation, uh, and they're kicking off really ambitious plans on climate action in Bangladesh through their Climate Innovation Fund. And this fund will promote um, innovation in climate resilient agriculture uh, and, and, and has a strong focus on supporting the most at-risk communities in Bangladesh, including coastal and farming communities. So just to quickly wrap up, I know I'm going at, at quite quite a bit of pace, so I, so I do apologise. But just to quickly wrap up, to address that question on how can diaspora communities be more effectively engaged in mitigating the effects of food insecurity and other climate change induced issues. Um, as I've mentioned, we're very, very early in our journey with the BDCA uh, and we're establishing our roots, but we fundamentally believe that the UK based Bangladeshi diaspora has so much untapped potential. There's many opportunities for British Bangladeshis to support climate induced challenges such as food security, um, but this goes beyond just the financial support, which we're, um, you know, very um, you know, which we give very readily. Um, you know, we have expertise, we have networks, and perhaps most importantly, we have a very strong emotional and personal tie with our country of origin, and we can't underestimate how powerful that is. Um, and now I'm sort of speaking directly to country of origin, sort of local agencies and national governments on this call, please do come and work with us. And by us, I don't mean the, just the BDCA, I mean the diaspora groups that, that exist. And if diaspora groups do exist, uh, you and the country of residence need to identify them. And if they don't exist, you need to help facilitate their existence, bring like minded people together. Um, the BDCA is a really good example of how we came together through a diaspora program led by British Council, led by Common Purpose and Lead Bangladesh. And now we're growing organically. So the next step for us uh, is around developing our proposals and engaging really meaningfully with the, the organisations I've just mentioned, but also the Bangladesh and UK governments. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I, I, I look forward to the discussions ahead uh, and to learn from you all. So I'll pass back to, to you, moderator. Thank you, Shahab. It's been a pleasure hearing you and it's very good to see dynamism, initiative and leadership uh, at play here. I would move forward and invite Mr. Jerome Breit to present his statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. And I would like to begin by actually um, thanking IOM for both inviting Bragg, but more importantly, for inviting the, the fellow members on this panel um, and congratulate IOM on the discussion topic. All too often, I, the, the voices of those directly impacted or those that can really bring solutions to the adaptation and resilience uh, um, reality are, are missing from the climate control rooms that are really discussing the way forward. I think what the panelists have uh, presented links well to the need of connecting across geographies, connecting across sectors, connecting across the different uh, diasporas that exist, uh, and this is really of critical importance. But while we're doing this, we need to make sure that those that are really impacted and at the heart of uh, facing the, the hard edge of the climate impact are, are really centered to those discussions. 
Now, climate action is really part, and we've heard this, of what Bangladesh uh, is facing today, but also has faced naturally over the past 50 years. Um, and, and really, this has been the way uh, BRAC has grown its response in terms of uh, an act uh, of anti-poverty. This has really been folded into our action, and in some ways grown into what we do, sometimes without us even realizing that what we are doing is really climate work uh, from the outset. As one of the largest anti-poverty NGOs, we have always approached our work from a human-centric approach. And I think this is key to maintain as we look forward for solutions, uh, that these solutions will come out of communities and that what solutions may work for one community or one group will not be the right one for another. So we need to recognize that, that, that diversity of need according to where people are from and what they're facing and how we're going to be answering the climate challenge moving forward. In view of the reality of climate change, actually the proportion of people we're working with, communities we're working with, has increased in terms of uh, the profile of those really impacted by climate change. And year on year, um, uh, this is growing. We know that the record breaking floods of the past years, whether it's in June of this year, where seven million, over seven million people were out of their homes, or 2020, where the cyclone uprooted some 2.5 million people, and we know that these millions of people need shelter, need the emergency response, need the first response, but they also need to rebuild their lives. And actually what we're learning at BRAC as we're moving forward is not just responding to today, but very much looking at how to ensure that we can both mitigate the consequences of this increasing climate reality as we move forward. In fact, what we need to rethink as a community uh, as, and our global response um, in how we approach climate is that it's not a punctual crisis. It's not just a crisis, it's way beyond the crisis. The reality we face today and then the changes that we are seeing are irreversible. And I think this is where we really need to be looking at new solutions, new approaches that don't just deal on a punctual basis in terms of what we're facing, but really recognize this as an irreversible change. Even if we have the most uh, uh, develop mitigation measures, we will not be going back to where we were. We need adaptation, and this adaptation must be locally led because it needs to be relevant to the communities um, and where they're from. Every single program that now we have at BRAC is really looking at resilience building. This is at the core of what we do, and we're integrating climate smartification, as we call it, into all of our work. BRAC is doing its best to move from what I mentioned, balancing the work of reacting to actually moving to extreme weather events and transitioning to a much more proactive stance. Now, how we're doing this, part of it will have to be uh, how we can really connect local adaptation works and individuals uh, and migrants impacted to the best science has to offer. And this is where we need to be working across different areas. So approaches need to connect uh, the communities and a good example of what we're working on today is a recent program called CruiseNet that we started with MIT um, and uh, that combines really the, the technical technological strengths of one of the world leading universities with uh, BRAC's deep adaptation capabilities but beyond that adaptation capability it's really our, our role to really connect with communities and individuals. MIT is providing the state-of-the-art super-localized climate forecasting capabilities, layering on top some of the key socioeconomic forecasting to reality we, to better understand realities and how these changes and the climate will affect people's homes, people's ability to grow crops and raise livestock and access to clean fresh water and more. With communities, our aim at BRAC is then to translate this information into actionable adaptation activities, allowing people to either adapt in place, for example, in areas where uh, there is there will be soil intrusion, but where homes um, will not necessarily be able to or need to be moved or be fully flooded. Mm -hmm. What can we do and how can we find other livelihoods or other agricultural practices that can sustain people where they are? Knowing that 2,000 individuals are also migrating towards Dhaka and that climate change uh, is therefore having a huge impact on informal settlements in Bangladesh, um, which is already the home to millions of people which are displaced and where living conditions is a challenge that is manifold from a lack of access to basic services such as health, education, 
water logging, where there are uh, often these uh, informal settlements are often situated in low-lying land with a lack of proper drainage, vector-borne diseases, and so on. Through the work with CruzNet, CruzNet, we also aim to identify what we are calling climate-safe, migrant-friendly cities. And we really need to be looking beyond just the today and finding alternatives to the main pool cities, cities that would be um, uh, that are not forecasted to be massively climatically impacted and to have the capacity to have um, uh, an integration capacity for climate migrants and allow them into their societies and enable a sustainable livelihood to be developed. In addition to this project, we will be looking to take the learning with migrants, with host communities and develop together with MIT uh, and use this to converse with policymakers to integrate adaptation activities at scale and see how far this can go beyond, not just in Bangladesh, but other parts of the globe and see how a backbone of work could then lead to uh, further adaptation. I think another area where we can really see that local realities and technology can further support mitigation uh, around food insecurity and creating greater resilience is around agriculture. From the get-go in view of the reality of Bangladesh, uh, BRAC has really been working hard on looking at what alternative crops can work in certain uh, areas and uh, at the ground level undertaking soil testing using uh, labs to conduct some 3,000 soil tests, uh, test samples a year and really identify how to address the deteriorating soil fertility and the erosion of biodiversity and what um, introduction and promotion of stress tolerant varieties of crops can be uh, brought in that uh, tolerate such conditions such as submergence, salinity, drought, um, and so on, um, to, and, and really looking at getting better yields out for farmers. So this, this is really to say that while we need to have things that are very much locally led, we also need to ensure, and I think it really touches to the point of both Rose and Shahan, had to connect to the bigger diaspora, to the bigger networks that exist out there to ensure that some of the solutions um, which come out of the local committees can really be connected to some, some of the technical solutions um, that are being developed elsewhere. Now, beyond our own programs and really to, to, to push on, on recognizing and ensuring that local ideas and local solutions uh, get visibilities, but also are able to be implemented uh, and have a pathway to program delivery, in 2019, BRAC also created a trust fund uh, called the Climate Bridge Fund with the support of the German government. The fund supports projects designed and implemented by local NGOs in Bangladesh to strengthen the resilience of people displaced or at risk of being displaced by climate change. It is a model in uh, terms of a civil society setting up a trust fund with the support of donors with uh, the ability of BRAC's knowledge and the ability to connect local conditions to local civil society and is very much an approach that gives a chance actually to many of the solutions that also Rose pointed out to actually be given a chance to actually implement. As we approach COP, I think there's very there, there's 27, there's really two discussion that we need to push uh, and ensure that we get some traction on. The first one is the proportion of funds allocated between mitigation measures and adaptation measures. We shouldn't be confronting or opposing both, but we need to really be looking at the proportional investments. In a world where climate change is irreversible, as much effort needs to be focused on how to adapt and uh, now and tomorrow as mitigating further degradation. These streams of work need to work hand in hand but currently it's extremely difficult as global investment in climate adaptation is only at a level of a single digit percentage between four to 8% of the dedicated uh, global financing on, on climate. The second main message that we really need to push for COP is that adaptation solutions that do not include the local uh, reality from the get-go, from the design will not work. And this we know is actually one of the main failings of adaptation is actually imposing solutions as opposed to designing solutions with the communities. And as such, um, maladaptation is a result and we need to turn this around and ensure that local actors and representation of the very diverse reality of those that are facing the climate challenge, uh, be it gender in particular, but all sexual engagements as well, are part of the discussion happening in the climate control rooms. Thank you very much.
Jerome, thank you so much for your words, and it's very good to see the comprehensive approach that an organization like BRAC, with such a, a global presence and outreach in Bangladesh, is doing. Uh, without further ado, I would like to pass to our next panelist. Um, IOM has committed to you, the member states, when we implemented the Migration, Environment and Climate Change Strategy from 2021 to 2030, to convene and bring the voices of migrants to this forum. It's my pleasure to bring to you uh, the voice of Ms. Rashid Begum, that is, uh, habits Bangladesh and is on the forefront of uh, climate impacts. Mr. Uh, Ms. Rashid Begun, uh, the floor is yours. Donabad. সাথে সিডল বন্যাটা হয়েছে এ বন্যায় আমার সব কিছু বাড়ি ঘর সব ভাসাইয়ে নিয়ে গেছে যাতে যখন ঘুমাইয়া গেছি হঠাৎ করে দেখতেছি যে অনেক পানি আমি উঠে পড়ছি উঠে করে আমার ভাইরে আমার ছেলে মেয়ে স্বামীকে নিয়ে যাইতেছি একটা বৃদ্ধাশ্রমে তখন আমার ভাই হাত থেকে সুইটা গেছে সুইটা যাওয়ার পরে আমার ভাইকে আর খুঁজে পাওয়া গেছে the interpreters would like to inform everyone that is an in, there will be consecutive interpretation আমার ভাইকে আর পাওয়া গেছে না আইসা বলি সুরতে ভেসে গেছে মানে অনেক সুরত তাতে আর পাইছি না পরে বৃদ্ধাশ্রমে আইসি ওখানে থাকলাম সরকার আমাদের সাহায্য করলো চিড়া দিল মুড়ি দিল রুটি দিল দুই মাস পর্যন্ত খাইলাম সবাই যার যার বাড়িতে চলে যায় আমার তো আর কোন বাড়িঘর নাই আমি কোথায় যাব তখন আমি ঢাকায় আসলাম তখন লোন চলা দাঁড়িয়ে হলো আমার কাছে ভাড়ার টাকা চাইতেছে আমি তাদেরকে বলছি যে ভাই আমার কাছে কোনো ভাড়ার টাকা নাই আমি এখন কোথায় যাব কি করব তখন সে আমাকে বলল যে আপু আপনি মহাখালী সাততলা যান ওখানে একটা বস্তি আছে বস্তির ভিতরে গিয়া লোকজনের কাছে বলেন ওরা আপনারে একটা কাজ জোগাড় করে দিবে বা একটা থাকার জায়গা দিবে তখন আমি আইসা এক লোকের বললাম যে আপু আমার একটা রুমের দরকার আমি কোথায় থাকবো ছেলে মেয়ে লইয়া তখন এক বাড়ি এলে আমাকে একটা রুম দিল বললো যে ভাড়ার টাকা দেবে না তখন আমি বললাম যে ভাইয়া আমি কাজকর্ম করবি আপনার ভাড়ার টাকা আমি পরিশোধ করে দিয়ে দেব তখন বলল ঠিক আছে তখন আমি দুই দিন পর্যন্ত না খাইয়া রয়েছি আমার পাশের এক রুমে ওই মহিলা আমার কড়া ভাত দিছে কোনো মতে খাইয়া কাজকর্ম করে আমি একটু একটু চলতেছি কাজেকর্মে কম নির্ভর চাই আমার স্বামী অসুস্থ ডায়াবেটিস হইয়া একা দৈরা গেছে হাত দিয়ে কোনো কাজ করতে পারে না মেয়েটা দিয়ে আমি একটু চলি আমার অনেক কষ্ট হয় এখন আর চলার মতন আমার কোন পথ নাই যদি দেশ গ্রামে আমি আবার ফিরে যাইতে পারতাম কেউ যদি এরকম আর একটু সাহায্য আমারে করতো 
तू घर भरी दिया एक तो गुरु बस दिया पहले हमें किस पुर गया देश गिरा में चलता हम हमें खाने अपना खाकर मुतल हमार पुरी सिटी ना यामार खूबी कोस्ट होए Miss Begum, thank you. We would like to ask your interpreter to share with us your perspective now. Uh, I'm Rashida Begum, and I currently live in Shaftola Slam, which is a low income settlement in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. I used to live in Borishal, a coastal district uh, in the south of Bangladesh. I used to live there with my husband, my son, my daughter, and my only brother, uh, who didn't have. I, my uh, husband used to. Uh, I had a home and a small piece of land, where my husband used to grow uh, vegetables and different crops, and that was enough mm -hmm. to meet the need of uh, the five of us. But everything changed in 2000. Seven, when the cyclone Cedar hit the south of Bangladesh. So I was sleeping when the cyclone hit our, our village. I, my, uh, when I woke, I woke up when uh, my whole house, home was inundated. I just took my uh, brother, my, uh, my son, my daughter, and my husband, and started running towards the only cyclone center I knew. But the, the water took my, uh, washed away my, my brother and I, I couldn't find him. I, uh, I, I was able to take my uh, son, my daughter and my husband and take them to the cyclone center and stayed there for two months. So after uh, two months, I didn't know where to go because I, uh, the, the, I lost my home and also my land. So one of my neighbors told me to uh, go to Dhaka where maybe I could find a job. So when I, so I took his advice and came here. I, I was here, I was able to find a place to stay, but for two days, there was nothing to eat. So that's when one of, one of the neighbors came forward and provided food for us. And she also helped finding a, a job for me as a domestic worker. My husband also was able to, uh, to find a job and he, he soon became a day laborer. So we are here, for two, uh, here for, uh, from, uh, 2000, since 2007, but I'm, I'm getting old now. And uh, I have many, uh, my health is deteriorating. It's a reason that many people don't want to give me a job anymore. And also my husband, uh, he had a heart, uh, a heart failure and was paralyzed. One of his hands is paralyzed and can't work anymore. Mm -hmm. I had a son, but he has, uh, he has his own family to feed now. So it's all me, my husband and my daughter. I couldn't marry my daughter off because uh, she has some uh, physical uh, problems and people don't want to mar marry her without any dowry. So right now, these are two of us uh, who work. My daughter works in a garment and she gets around 6,000 uh, taka uh, in a month. And that's what that's feeding us. Uh, for, uh, there are days that we don't, uh, we don't uh, get to eat. And I don't know where things are going to be for us because these are the people uh, that are, and we, we get no help. If there was any way, I would have gone back uh, to the place I came from, but there is no, there's nothing there. So that's all from me, Rashida Begum. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Begum and, and the colleagues uh, that presented. I think this is a very powerful testimony of the existing today impacts of climate change and combining crises of issues around social inequality, 
poverty and the importance of moving forward with the agenda 2030 and sustainable development, bringing opportunities, but also bringing partnerships and integrating communities at risk, communities of origin, communities of destination, migrants, refugees, and IDPs. Um, I think now we would open the floor for interventions. Thank you so much. I, I would now like to just ask our panelists, uh, starting uh, again with um, Mr. Miss, uh, Miss Begun and her translator, on one final message to the group of people convening here and to uh, the COP discussions, if you may. Thank you. If our colleagues are not yet ready, I will follow up the same question to Jérôme. Thank you very much. Um, I will be sure that you Thank you, Ms. Begun. I would like to ask the translator to provide us that feedback. So, right now, I have no voice and uh, there is nothing I can do to go back to my village. So, if there was any way where we could, uh, we could be provided support with, maybe through a uh, house a place to stay or some means that could uh, give us uh, uh, some means of livelihood that would have been really nice for us. Thank you. Donabad, Ms. Begun, uh, for your uh, perspective and points on the importance of immediate action. Um, can I ask Jerome to take the, his last remarks? Yes, I think it's recognizing the ero ero irreversible reality that we're facing today. And in view of that irreversible reality, adaptation, and in particular, locally-led adaptation, to really be able to provide the answers to uh, Mrs. Biggin's reality has to be proportionally invested. Um, this is not just about uh, future commitments, but already meeting past commitments and ensuring that uh, the proportion, and I think as the Secretary General pointed to, needs to be much greater than it is today. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, Shabab, please. Hi. Yes, I think if, if it was just just one message that that I can I can give to sort of policymakers and 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 everyone in this virtual room, it's that diaspora communities uh, can do more and need to do more. And I would really encourage local agencies and and sort of national governments uh, from countries of origin to to really utilise and, and and tap into the power of diaspora communities across the across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Shabab. Rose? Um, yes, thanks. I think I'll start by answering a question that is in the chat box. Or I can see Georgia asked, how can young people from the Global North collaborate with young people from Global South to act together and find solutions for the more vulnerable? Uh, yeah, thanks, Georgia. I think that is already a commitment of what's of you know, wanting to work with uh, young people from the global south. There are very many ways we can work together from, you know, knowledge exchange, uh, especially hearing stories from the global north and from the global south and together finding solutions. Uh, you, you could volunteer with some youth organizations that are in, best in the global south and support them in terms of like their research needs and uh, implementation needs and, and communication needs. And uh, we can also continue standing in solidarity and calling for climate justice each time you meet or get in touch with your leader or online or in, you know, join, uh, for example, Friday for Futures strikes, uh, uh, school, uh, school climate strikes. Uh, 
resource mobilization is also the other part that uh, as young people from the global north can embark on, uh, but of course also convincing your governments in the global north to treat climate the climate crisis as a crisis rather than as a political stance. And then, uh, yeah, to go to my, clo my closing remark on what I think the policymakers could do, uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is voices like Rashida's voice, voices for the young people, for the communities at risk, for the women, for the indigenous communities, for the youth and children should be, in fact, must be part of every decision that you make. While you are making decisions, while you're in those rooms, while you're you know, lobbying for funds, while you're developing policies, those are the voices that should be in your mind. And not only voices, but these people, we the young people, the, the women and the vulnerable groups should be in the rooms with you as collaborators and co-designers. If you ask someone like Rashida, she has solutions to her problems, but if, if a policymaker is just going to think about what Rashida wants, he'll pro he or she will probably come up with very different solutions. So uh, we need to work with decision makers and policymakers as co-designers, as collaborators, and as partners to address the existential threats of climate change. Thank you, Rose. Um, and thank you to the remaining panelists. Allow me now to do a few concluding remarks on what our panelists have brought today uh, so that we can bring to an end uh, the session of today. I think the personal experience of Rose, uh, as she presented on the beginning, uh, represents the aspirations of countless other generations across the globe that have and must have a role and a participating seat on the decisions that will impact today, but also their future. It is significantly important the raising awareness and sharing of information to vulnerable communities so that their needs can de facto become a reality in terms of policies and programs. Climate education and technological investments without forgetting indigenous knowledge are powerful tools to move us forward. Shehab has brought also to us the importance of the diaspora, how to channel diaspora contributions to policy and implementation, focusing and highlighting that diaspora in the countries of residents has to become more visible, more participative, more inclusive, but also working with countries of origin and foster learning and impact at origin and with governments and communities far, far away from their current residences. The wide range of engagement of BDCA is an example of diaspora engagement and participation and something that we see a value on fostering, replicating and scaling. And Jerome has brought to us the importance of a human-centric approach based on context. It's also an explanation of how at core BRAC works on resilience and on being proactive before tragedy strikes. The challenges of climate change and urbanization in countries such as Bangladesh on the forefront of climate change and others like the Philippines and most recently in Pakistan are growing. Action must be prioritized and must be swift. And finally, the testimony of Ms. Begun, one of the many millions of people that today already struggle, suffer, and try to have their lives at the most normal level possible on the forefront of climate with crises multiplying and combining, impacting their daily lives, forcing them to choices instead of giving them the opportunity to choose about their mobility. IOM is very focused in continue to contributing, allowing the right to choose in relation to human mobility in the context of climate change disasters and environmental degradation. I thank you all for your presence today and for the reflections made by our panel that once again, I thank for being with us today. And the chair has asked me to convene that we will reconvene at three. Thank you so much.